Welcome back to PPCM's Painful Truth. Today's guest, Ashley Williams. Thank you so much for your time today in educating us and the viewers on your peripartum cardiomyopathy PPCM experience. Um, tell me who you are and where where are you from? And uh, I'm Ashley, and I live in Dublin, Georgia. Okay, cut out a little bit. Let's say uh, I'm Ashley Williams, and I live in Dublin, Georgia. You live in Dublin, Georgia. Okay, and um, when were you first diagnosed peripartum cardiomyopathy? At what age? Um, thirty-one. Okay, and what? That's it's interesting because it's like within the thirties, between um twenties, and you know, and the thirties, forties is kind of like very common. Um, right. Were you diagnosed? During your pregnancy or when your life was at a threat? Um, it was denied. Uh, so I had my girl at 4.15 um, on April 18th and mid-morning of the 19th. They were doing a lot of tests and scans um, all through the night um, just due to vital signs that were irregular, um, very low oxygen levels. And How many weeks pregnant were you? Um, I was 39 weeks. 39 weeks already. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, a lot of the information I didn't get until later, but they assumed initially I may have had a blood clot in my lung. And after an echocardiogram, um, my EF was 35 and they started to pinpoint the diagnosis specifically. Got it. And who was it that diagnosed you? Was a cardiologist or a gynecologist? Um, kind of a combination of the two. My gynecologist, okay. but you know, he was obviously following up, ordering a lot of things. And then, to be honest, um, I remember waking up at two o'clock in the morning after several tests were run, and they had, you know, I was on a lot of medication trying to control everything that was going on. And I did have a cardiologist, my OBGYN, and several nurses were around me at that time. Amazing. So you had actually a very good health care surrounding you with the awareness of that there was a, you were obviously experiencing a life threat. Yes, but I will tell you this, the, the guy that actually, the, the doctor that actually um, delivered my little girl, I had never laid eyes on him prior to that day. He did not follow me through my pregnancy. Um, so extremely thankful um, for him because uh, the gentleman that had followed me, the doctor that followed me throughout my pregnancy. What was your, who was your, throughout your visits through your pregnancy? Um, who was your doctor and was it at a hospital or was it a, a midwife or who, who, what was it the was person? Doctor. Saying? Um, he had followed me throughout my pregnancy. I'm sorry, um, who? Do I have to say the name? I'm trying to not to oh. be. Oh, Okay. Too well, a lot of my friends use him and a very respectful man, but was, I don't think had any awareness whatsoever in the peripartum cardiomyopathy. He, and the reason I say that is, um, my husband and I both, every time we would go in, we had a lot of complaints, blood pressure, swelling, um, rapid heart rate, just general things. And it was my first pregnancy. I did not know what to expect. Um, I, I was obviously I knew what my friends had gone through and their stories were not aligning with mine whatsoever. Right. Um, but I will say that after I had her and was educated, apparently they thought um, it was missed greatly and that I um, probably started developing a lot of symptoms around six months which I will tell you is when I started to swell greatly. And um, Dr. Brian Lee is the one that actually um, called it. And I mean, he never missed a beat. He really just went through the process. Yeah. And even since then have educated some students when I come in for just my yearly checkups. Yes. And he has specifically said, you know, people that are otherwise healthy and you're not really looking for anything, you'll miss it. And you'll essentially, they may not make it. So, you know, I'm thankful that the Lord put him in our, in our path. 
Absolutely. Um, no, he should definitely be recognized as a hero yeah. because he did save your life. Um, he did. What, hosp- what hospital? Um, what hospital was this? Um, this was in Macon, uh, Macon, Georgia. It was the Coliseum at the time. Um, now it's Piedmont. What is it? Piedmont. Piedmont H- Hospital uh, or Medical yeah. Center. Coliseum at the time. They've just recently been bought out. <clears throat> Well, that's good for anybody that's in Georgia um, yes. that is listening to this and, you know, would like the recommendation of him. Um, that's very important. And um, that's what we're here and why we are talking. Um, these conversations, they really, really, really need to um, be talked about. Um, okay. I believe that if and this is just could be my theory. And this is just something that I've, you know, um, I like to do documentations. Um, I'm very much of a person that, you know, my, I myself throughout my pregnancy, I documented everything. Right. Which is only natural that I would start a docuseries. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I feel like documentation is a lot of self-advocacy and not just right. for individually for you and for me. Um, but we have the awareness it's for the people and the women and families that can prevent this catastrophe with having the information. And <clears throat> some people don't know where to go. Um, there's a, you know, it's like kind of like where, you know, this is not like where you go to buy something, you know, to rebuild a home. This is something to, you know, maintenance your heart. You know, this is life you know, life and death for, 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 you know, it was for me and myself and, you know, and many other women and for ones who, you know, stayed on the other side, you know, we are their voices. Agreed. And and so, you know, there's not many people that, you know, I'm sitting basically across the room from you and there's, I, I mean, I can relate with you without you even really saying much because I went through exactly the same thing you went through. Um, You know, there's no degree, I believe, of the type of um, catastrophe with this. You know, it's it's there's every woman has their own experience, but each experience is just, you know, heavy and life changing, life changing. And that's the painful truth. Agreed. Yes. I mean, when you hear no more babies, you may not live through another one. You know, you and your child both could have not made it. And we heard that multiple times. Um, It it definitely brings a new perspective. Absolutely. I said that. I say that every time. And my husband just um, documented and recorded a an appointment that I had with my cardiologist at the Women's Center at UCLA and you know the, like the literally the thing that I think that I've said twice was is that this disease has changed me yes. and um I mean to the point where you know I still have my company but you know working in the industry um but now I I I own a nonprofit and I dedicate a lot of my time to this awareness for well, we women appreciate- like you in America. I've said it before and, and walking into that understanding that there was a struggle um, yeah. until fully educated, I really had no idea how much of my life would change. And there's a level that I know it will not return, you know, from the apprehension of just general everyday stuff, life in general has drastically changed physically and mentally. And how, how, like, I know for me, I have a list of, of things that changed my life. Um, Like, where were you then to where you are now in terms of just like your daily routine? Um, I would say that was a huge struggle just, and I still, you know, suffer from a lot of PBCs and just things with my heart. I mean, you know, you'll forever have a cardiologist. Um, just walking upstairs is a challenge. Um, tons better than I was, but I can look at a flight of stairs and 
ask a hundred times, how, how many other ways can we go? This is the only way. Is there not another? <laughs> yes. Um, you know, and, and I see, you know, friends or my mom, um, we went to the Biltmore house for Christmas, uh, year before last. And, you know, just vacations in general have changed. I constantly think, what if something happens? You know, do I have all my medications? You know, do I need refills before I go? Um, you know, watching her just kind of maneuver through the stairs. And I remember, thank God for good family support. But I remember saying, you know, you just go on up, give me just a minute, I'll be there. And of course, she stops and waits. I mean, very good family support. But um, the things that I would have normally done, um, you know, my heart rate will escalate immediately. And just things have become about since then, you know, the sinus tachycardia, um, you know, postural tachycardia. There's just, a, there's just a, a lot of things that have happened since then. Um, you know, I can't tell you that I, I can't do things. Um, I know that, you know, getting on roller coasters with my child is probably not a good idea. You know, certain ones that I normally would have done way back when. Right. Um, you know, there's, there's some running and playing, but it's definitely not, not the same as prior to pregnancy. You know, the activity level has, has changed. Yeah. And, um, that's what, you know, even same with me, I get that, you know, I was a dance, you know, dancer, yoga, you know, go getter and a, and a, with an active career. And, um, it was, it was pregnancy induced. Right. So now, um, my way of life is it's like you, it's it, all of these things like, factor in as part of our daily now routine that we have to incorporate and kind of like not just cope with but accept which I find is um like endless justice agreed it's a daily struggle if you overthink it um you know or if you're you're one to compare Mm -hmm. which I've tried to to let that go you know you can't compare yourself to somebody else and what they can do and but, um, yeah, it's a lifelong journey. There's no going back. So, it, it, you know, I would say acceptance was hard, but, mm-hmm. you know, you have to do it and move forward. Yeah. And, like, I think that's kind of like, you know, it's not like it's easier said than done. Um, you know, I, I, for me personally, um, I've worked with my mental health. Um, I know to meet myself at the level. And, you know, I mean, what, obviously what any PPCM survivor goes through are right. all the natural symptoms of postpartum depression as well Agreed. as a whole other layer of like um added on top of that. Yeah, um, you're learning to be basically a new person in a sense and a lot of people absolutely. can't visually see that. Um, right. And, and it is, it's like, in a sense, when we say it's our heart anniversary, you right. know, yes. um, I feel like that's kind of like what it is. It's like, you know, in a sense, we're reborn where we have to now relearn, redirect, you know, educate ourselves, yes, advocate for ourselves you know, advocate for our children and yeah. other women. And it's, it's, it creates a whole other a feeling of responsibility. I think when a woman survives this disease, um, yes. as <clears throat> we're talking here today about it, um, which is um, informative, uh, you know, to, to a woman who, you know, is depending on just solely what her doctor says and, but still never diagnosed or treated and feeling like she's going to die because in all reality she is dying. Right. Her body is failing Yes, and it's not an exaggeration. It's not a hypochondriac um, complaint. Right. You know? But I think, it doesn't help that people can't visually see you suffering because a lot of times it's inside and yes. You know, and what it's like to not be able to walk from your bed to the bathroom and back yes. without 
gasping for air or, you know, understanding what it means to know that your oxygen levels were 68. You know, those exactly. are things that grasp until you live, live through that. And then, um, you know, the thoughts of, of returning to that state is just, I mean, it's traumatic. I will say it that. Is. Um, it is. It's very traumatic. I had, I mean, I'm on medication for it. Like I said, I was having night terrors. Yes. Um, I'd, I'd hold my breath while I was sleeping and then in wake up, I'd wake up yeah. and I'd be like, <gasps> you know, like as if like my heart would be like, you know, completely like beating out of my chest. And I'm like, this is definitely not normal. Um, right. And like, these are signs that our bodies tell us that other people cannot, you know, see. It's something that's that we right. feel. And that's why the blood test is so important. Um, you know, this interview t- and my interviews are based on United States of America maternal death rate. I have interviewed other women. Today I interviewed a woman from Canada. Mm. Um, and I look forward to, because we're going to do a continuation, I look forward to adding it. But I cried afterwards. And sometimes I get emotional about interviews. This one really hit me because a lot of women are in America are um, not diagnosed Mm -hmm. and, and, and the, and they have free health care and they have free insurance and, uh, and they have the health care, the care of the health care, you know, and, um, as well as the awareness right. of, of this disease, which, um, you know, I, I, I want to know what was the test that diagnosed her during pregnancy? Um, was it the NT pro BNP test? You know, was it something different that we don't know? Right. Um, America, American women have one of the highest death rates globally. And we have the highest insurance. What are you, do you mind me asking? What has your insurance company? Um, do you get it through work? Do you do you pay out of pocket? Yeah, you know, I get it through my job. And at the time, I had a um, I had a federal insurance, and um, I mean, it, it was great insurance. You know, I think um, the diagnosis. Once you're diagnosed, I feel like. I didn't have a lot of problems when it it came to insurance, but I guess my thing is early awareness. Like what can we do to catch this ahead of time? Because there's always things that they want to do. Insurance wants you to follow through with first, you know, what are your signs and symptoms? Why do you want this test done? But to live this journey, it's well worth whatever we have to do. Um, to get insurance to recognize how important any prior test would be that would diagnose us early. Um, right. And that's you know. why, and that's why, um, you know, the test, sh- the test should be standard and mandatory um, in, in America and diagnosed just like it does in any other country. Yes. And, um, and so I, I, I was crying because that's kind of like what, my dream is mm-hmm. for America is for there to be awareness, um, more um, caring for women as doctors to know that when there's something wrong and a woman seems like she's off to get the proper blood tests yes. and know those blood tests and be mm-hmm. aware of the symptoms and the signs and then this can be all prevented. But without the diagnosis and the blood tests, there really can't be treatment. And that's right. the difference between, you know, what I noticed today and in, 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 and also in other parts of the countries that I've interviewed, there's a difference. And I, 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 I hear it. And I'm sure that when you know, each interview is being aired. I'm being honestly really, you know, very transparent, 
you know, because right. um, the reason also why I started this is because I, I feel that every PPCM woman can can maybe put the pieces together on, exactly. on this. And help each other. And help each other. Yes. Um, why is it that we have that one of the highest death rates? Um, we are discovering this. Yeah. And, and I went and- that it was missed for 39 weeks. You know, I can understand that's the first late, you know, that's excessive. And I remember being told you really should have had her at least seven to eight weeks early. You know, Absolutely. this, I mean, when I went in to have her, her heart rate was heart rate was 20. Mm-hmm. So she and I both, you know, we're talking about the mothers because we're the ones affected, but we're carrying another life. You know, that's essentially two lives being at risk. Um, just for lack of either education, awareness, or just lack of being attentive to that patient and understanding their changes, whether they're the first time mom or the third, you know, we need to be heard. Our symptoms need to be known. You know, there's the blood just a lot of things. Be, that I look yeah. At. The, 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 the screening labs and testings need to be, um, need, need to get with the times. Agreed. And, I feel like at this point, you know, after, you know, what I've learned today is, is that I'm even more so like passionate about, you know, where this is going to go as women throughout the world come and show up and talk about their experience because, you know, even with you and your experience and like, you know, just learning that like and recognizing that you do have to relearn who you are yeah. and kind of as a new mom with your friends around you that are pregnant, mm-hmm. for me, I it was it was hard. You know? Yeah. I mean I don't know how you feel about that. Um, I'm sure like, you know, it's a different experience, like you said. Um, Yeah. Realized what a smooth pregnancy could be or how less traumatic. No, you did not have that. You're never going to experience that, you know. Um, You know, and and it is hard, um, which I've, I've seen some stories where, you know, it, it may have not happened until maybe the third pregnancy and they maybe could compare pregnancy for myself. I, it was a one time and just to hear one, had we had more awareness, had there been a little bit more, um, testing, you know, maybe I could have had another child. Maybe I had that um, I do not have that anymore. You know, that, that is gone for me forever. Same um, me. and that was a hard pill to swallow. Yes. So it, that, it, it was it, it for, for, for me as well. I mean, yeah. it was definitely, you know, it was something that I had to really accept. That's that word again. Um, you know, which is fine. You know, I, it's funny. I'm, I'm come up with these things on like, you know, kind of like, Oh, like I say things to myself, like, you know, this world is so expensive. It's a good thing. I have one, or I can't believe with, with, with moms who have like, Oh, two is a game changer. And, you know, like I, I come up with all these scenarios, you know, cause I, Whatever like, we- ourselves (laughs) exactly it's whatever we tell ourselves and you know I have you know down the street a you know a mom of five and you know you know and I think gosh like you did you did five I couldn't even barely do one I say it all the time in front of me and I couldn't do that because I was in a coma and you know it's like I'm 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 very happy for them but at the same time you know I go in my in my room and I'm like you know I mean it's still it's 
it's the painful truth. You know, you put on a good face and, you know, and you're like, oh, you know, but it does. The fact that we can't have any more children is definitely something that it's a shame that it wasn't caught early. And when and 39 weeks is late, I demanded my baby out at 41 weeks. And wow. my doctor who was caring for me throughout, she was in Hawaii um, at the time. I couldn't even close my hands and she said it was normal. So, you I, know, I, it's like- it, 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 The things that you see your friends do and you literally cannot put on an act. I mean, you know, people are like, wear flip-flops. You can't get them on. <laughs> right you know like you're essentially like what is left this is not normal but we right. depend on our doctors we depend on them to pick these things out I mean you know that that I think is what bothered me the most is should I have been more vocal but I I didn't know how to stress that and so any any help that I can give to anybody else you know I, I will do it any day just to try to get I mean, you know, this awareness could easily save someone's life, but Absolutely. to know how close we were to not raising our kids and not being there to see these, you know, these milestones, you know, that's a big deal. It is. It's um, every day, you know, and I like, even like, you know, yesterday with Liam, like, you know, he's five and you know, he's now, he's at such a cute age and he was a star student and, you yes. know, I had to write, you know, a beautiful thing about him. And, um, you know, I, I, I expressed how, you know, he is my like S O N, like my sunshine and, you know, they really are, they're, they're miracles. And the Absolutely. fact that we're still here is a miracle, you know, I agree. to be able to like, you know, not miss these milestones and and i'm frustrated and angry and trying to trying to you know turn lemon into lemonades with you know with what we know and with what we don't know and with what we need to know and we're not going to get the answers that we want until right. these conversations are being spoken up about and you know, and the devastation that can happen because we were healthy prior to a pregnancy induced complication. And it's like, <clears throat> they send you home, like, okay, go live your life with no advocacy, right? No real support, except for trying to learn how to cope through this d awful disease that is not anyone any girl's fault that's common just rare but that's not true it's the gynecologist's fault it's the OBGYN's fault women have been giving birth and and it's like we're still suffering and like it's the 18 1400s and um like why is there not to yeah. be done like, and, you know, I, I also through the journey and trying to educate myself and, and of course, reading on other people's journeys, the number of the EF that you get um, really does not depict what your symptoms are going to be, exactly. you know, 35 to some people is not, that was not that low in comparison but my body's response at 35 was horrendous. Right. You know, um, I remember trying to come out of what I knew was, I, I knew things were going bad. I knew, um, you know, I felt like I was suffocating. I remember kind of going in and out and I remember having the oxygen um, mask placed on me and trying to basically breathe again. And I remember hearing, you know, try hard, you know, breathe. If you've ever been in that state, there's no try. You're giving it all you have. You're living on a prayer at that point. It is like, Absolutely. 
suffocating and, and not being able to explain or talk and verbalize. Yeah. And, um, I remember gasping and asking not to be intubated. And I remember her saying, you're just going to have to try, you know, we're trying not to, you're going to, I mean, I don't think I've ever fought so hard, um, in my life, but that was, um, that was a lot. That was, that was a lot to try to fight, you know, and I know girls, you know, have definitely been intubated and, um, and, and not to have taken that journey, but, um, mentally it is, um, you know, you know, mentally, it just is a lot to overcome even years later. I mean, I'm almost eight years out and, you know, talking about it doesn't make it any less emotional at this point. No, absolutely. I always say it's like, it's an, it's an endless grief and, um, and it doesn't matter how much time passes. Um, it's the same thing, like, you know, any type of grieving, um, you can always go back to that moment, even yeah. if it was like 20 years ago and remember, you know, and have the same feelings. I mean, you can't, pain doesn't have memory. So you physically can't, like when I had my cardiac arrests, my death, my coma, my everything, just heart, it, it was all one big blur, but mm -hmm. I remember the fight. I remember yeah. what what I was fighting for when I knew I couldn't breathe. And this was like way before even my cardiac arrests. I mean, so it it is. And I know that after with my heart procedure and my mom passed, it wasn't like PPCM took me down. My mom got walking pneumonia. So when oh. she died, I had to really grieve. And I, and yeah. even I posted something even yesterday, um, you know, when you code and you die and you have your times of death, I, I do believe that there, that there's no such real thing as death. It's just like a, a, a transformation of the new chapter of life. And I was pronounced dead over 30 minutes each death, each cardiac death, which was over a very long time to have your heart stopped. And the veil is a lot thinner than we believe. And, you know, my mom and I, we were very, very close. Um, you, my best friend my whole life. And she shows me signs. And it's interesting how when you do have a near death experience, and you kind of get a glimpse like where your soul being and your soul spirit kind of like merge you f and, and you kind of experience that it's almost as if like you are awakened, like you have some sort of, you know, understanding and you get that million dollar question answered. But then, you know, you like that fear, like you know, whereas like postpartum depression, like some women are suicidal, where I think with us in, in postpartum depression, we don't want to die. We want to live. Agreed. And I think I just, my, my perspective changed in feeling like I knew I've always known every person has a purpose, but just knowing, um, for me, I knew right then, you know, the Lord had a purpose for me. There wasn't a question for that. I knew that, that, you know, I would be able to help somebody. I knew that regardless of whether it's today via this video or anything that I could do, you know, the Lord had a purpose for me and, to, you know, to, was, to, to speak on behalf. Yeah. To speak on behalf of the women who, who stayed on the other side. And I, and I, yeah. I do believe that, you know, I mean, I always say like our voice today is powerful. We are, we have hero voices because Agreed. we lived through maternal mortality in the United States of America with zero to less than zero awareness. 
not really any collaboration between blood codes between cardiology and gynecology. So therefore there's no diagnosis, no treatment. And we lived. Right. And we struggle, but yes, we do have a purpose and this is our purpose. Our purpose is to connect, talk, and to um, hope that, you know, this pregnancy movement and hopefully with, you know, the angels that I feel are kind of, you know, definitely placing me here, um, you know, to provide this platform so that women can see that this is, this is common. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm booked. I mean, I have, I'm booked, I think all the way to like, I think now May, I mean, every day, whether it's like in person or, you know, three to four a day interviews and they're all over the world may you know mainly in america right you know because that's where i'm f this is a global woman pregnancy movement but the right. difference between america and other countries is is that they have the instrument and kits to the diagnosis our reliability is on cardiology. Right. So it's like, I don't know. It's, it's definitely a, a medical collaboration where survivors are saying, you know, a well, cardiologist. You got me intrigued because there's a lot of things I still, even eight years in, I don't know what's out there. I don't know even the things that you know. Um, you know, just like your story is so inspiring. And, you know, I look back and, and understand how fortunate even I was, even though you and I, you know, thankfully lived through this. But, you know, your story is just, um, you know, so much worse with your cardiac arrest and things like that. But then I look and realize, you know, we all have such different stories, but ultimately we could have ended up in the same situation. Absolutely. And our diagnosis is yet maybe broad in our journey and what we went through, but it, it still is a very difficult thing to overcome. Um, it is. I'm, I know. actually, um, you know, with, um, you know, the defibrillator, I don't know if you can see the, the microphone, um, okay. but the, the veins, uh -huh. you know, are, I didn't wear a good sweatshirt for this, but, um, you know, the struggle behind death is waking up and having zombie issues. <laughs> I do have these zombie issues. And so yeah. with my knowledge of coming you know, back from cardiac death is, um, there needs to be more, um, patch testing awareness. If don't ever approve anything inside of your body yeah, without having an allergist test those components, because I was allergic to 11 components that were shoved into my heart and the really? veins are very bad. Next, wounds of wisdom. With having a device, my EF percent was 10. I coded. They panicked. I did not need the device. I needed the, inf I needed the fluid removed out of me, the infection cured. But they implant devices into women. Yeah. Fibulators and pacemakers. But they don't use a, they don't use a scar tissue prevention. No. Once you get scar tissue, there's no cure and it's deadly. All right. But there is a prevention. So when I went back to the person who saved my life, now he saved my life. Mm -hmm. um, but I went back to him and I said, are, are you familiar with patch testing awareness? No. I said, why? Well, I, I let him know that, yes, you saved my life, but... I could have died. You know, I had 18 months later, uh, my heart was blue black. When you, you pull out the wire, it's, it's my heart is turning red again. I was allergic to it, 
But when it, you, but the most important issue of shortening my life was the scar tissue prevention. It wasn't used. And he said, oh, it's not cosmetic. And so what, you know, my husband said was, uh, it's more than cosmetic. It's internal medicine. Right. And you're actually physically going into a side, a heart inside your body. You're right. It's not cosmetic. They use it in cosmetic and they don't have scar. They don't have scar tissues because they use the prevention. It's like a film. Right. So women are now dying from blood clots and things as such created by the scar tissue of the implant. So from my take on my experience, I would say to anybody who has ever had a PPCM experience, let's say relapses, and they want to put a device inside of you, mm -hmm. I think devices are great. They can save a life. They are very helpful. I had a love-hate relationship personally. If I wasn't allergic to it, I would have kept it in. Yeah. But, you know, I remembered when I was a teenager at Wildwood in Atlantic City or down the shore um, in, in New Jersey, I got a belly ring and I, it, 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 I didn't take belly rings well. I didn't take jewelry well. So gotcha. that's a sign that if you react to certain gold or certain metals or titanium, then you don't get an MRI because the, MRIs have liquid contrast. That yes. almost killed me. After getting the defibrillator, that was that had the same components that was in the MRI contrast. So here they removed it, but then they injected it into my veins. The the metal that I'm allergic to. So then I got way worse. Okay. So <clears throat> awareness with what we know and what we don't know and like you said depending on your doctors is um there's a fine line yeah definitely there's just a lot like i i just i i have a loop recorder which is it so nothing attached to my heart um but you know every time i go you you know you, you want to ask questions and wonder you know what because I, I say I relapsed, but I had definitely a drop in EF because of other diagnoses that came afterwards. Mm -hmm. And so trying to continuously keep that EF above normal and, you know, trying to struggle to do that, um, you know, it's difficult, you know, even though what I'm are not you doing, what do you do to try to keep your EF percent above um, 50? They, you know, have just encouraged, you know, exercise activity, you know, something to just strengthen it. But any activity runs my heart rate up, which again right. is you only want it to a certain point because then at that point you could be damaging it. So it's, you know, you're constantly trying to learn to balance things. You know, where's your target heart rate? You know, when I get on the elliptical, you know, it doesn't need to be over, you know, a certain amount. If it gets over that, you know, they want it under that. And you know, it's not like the average person just goes and exercises. I know. That does not happen with us. You know, everything is by, you know, balance and trying to figure out, you know, what you can do versus what you can't do. And I remember after diagnosis, my first um, time exercising, I actually did the exact same exercise prior to this. And when I tell you that I struggled, um, same there's just really no term for it. It was something that 60 year old women, <laughs> you know, could do with, with no problem. I'm 31 years old and struggling to just do anything. Um, I mean, that's when I knew my first time trying to get back into exercise. I mean, I just knew, you know, this was going to be a lifelong thing. And I immediately started trying to just accept stuff. I mean, you know, I, obviously I don't eat the greatest in the world, but I do try diet wise to do better, you know, mm -hmm. to, to do what I can and, and try to exercise. Um, but you're still running around with a small child, you know, you're trying to fit in everything and literally our life, if you can ever say a life is all about balance, 
you know, people use that term very loosely, but with peripartum cardiomyopathy or in general, that is what you live by. That's your new means. You know, everything is management. Yeah. I mean, you know, and it, it's a wide range of things that you have to balance. No, absolutely. I mean, it definitely is. It's making time and then also setting yourself when you are, let's say, you know, you're going from something emotional, but then you have to be mommy and it's like you're, you know, it's almost like you have to like not shut it off, but you have to like, okay, stay focused, task at hand. I had, you know, this, but now I have to you know, flip this switch, you know, um, it definitely is time management with working out. Um, you hit it on the nail. Yeah. I, I had, a at Equinox in West Hollywood, I did a a rock and model body workout class and, uh, my teacher's grace and she would, I mean, literally in the class, there would be pregnant women and I wanted to be the pregnant woman like my friend Ava that would literally basically give birth on the, on the dance floor, on the floor. And, um, and I've said this for over 10 years and I always said, Oh, you know, when I meet a guy, I'm going to be pregnant in here, just like all year. And, you know, it's a hard workout. I mean, there's a bar, there's a ball, there's, you know, the magic circle, there's the weights. I mean, and it's like, you're doing, it's like a dance kind of, but it's, it's a very, uh, mixed with yoga and I was a champ at it in the front always like giving it doing it rocking it and like loving it and then I got pregnant and my other girlfriend Jessica she was pregnant too at the same time I was and I noticed I wasn't doing so hot I wasn't doing good at all I couldn't even stand on my toes I couldn't like do what I was doing and I just felt like I was going to collapse, which never I felt like that in all the years. Yeah. And then even like afterwards I coded Grace couldn't, she couldn't believe because she saw how healthy I've been for over a decade Mm -hmm. going to her class, consistent, dedicated, you know, even with all the girls, like we all have our spot, you know, it's like really like a dedication workout. And, um, afterwards it was just such a struggle. I was in the back. I was, I was from 105 pounds pregnant at a hundred and at 200 pounds going there at getting 40, 50 pounds of fluid removed, going yes. back to, a class where I was literally a toothpick petite and, and like loving, you know, rocking it to yeah. in the back a hundred. I started, uh, it was 172 pounds. Yeah. Well, I was, and, I walked in, read my chart yesterday. Just, I had to go for a follow-up and 197. And I remember within you know, a matter of a day drawing 30 pounds of fluid. Yep. You can, you know, that's a lot. And it's just a lot of fluid. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't and know. And you retain a- it back and back and forth. And so it's like a, it's a struggle, but I didn't give up. I did it for a whole year and I got down to 128 and then COVID hit. Oh. And it took me a long time mm-hmm. to get from, I would stay at like, like 148, I remember for like three months and then 138 for like three months and now I'm back up, but it's like, you know, the, the dedication, the consistency of a PPCM survivor. I mean, it, it, it's self motivation, you know, and, um, you know, I would even mind in the future starting, you know, my workout that I've done for so long and my body was just, you know, beautiful and I still apply that, but it's, it does. It's, it's not like how I was. I'm not, like you said, it's like to go back to the same workout is like, yeah, I can push it and do it, but I'm definitely not the same. And I see that. 
you know. and it, it's a struggle. I mean, just I, I, that's the thing. It's like your your norm, what you are, who you are, um, has forever changed. Mm-hmm. You know, even with just little things. Um, you know, it, it's just a it's a big it's a big deal. You know, when you really have to go back to where you were and what you were doing, and to know that you know those things are you know, some of them aren't achievable always, you know what I mean? I mean, we can work hard and get to certain points. And I think, um, you know, some of mine specifically with COVID and just, um, a lot of the girls on our Facebook page and stuff, um, COVID's really hit hard on some of these girls and, you know, some have not made it through. And I think for me, that's been, um, you know, I'm human, you know, that's a, it's a fear, you know, because I, I understand the respiratory aspect of it and um, just the challenges and, and wanting so badly to return to where I was and even eight years, just still having some discouragement. Absolutely. So, and, and that's why I think the, the groups are helpful. And I think, you know, what encourages us is just basically knowing that, you know, what we have is a woman um, like bond where more so than the average woman, you know what I'm saying? When it comes to somebody that has, you know, definitely knocked on, you know, death's door or has experienced even the thought that it could even possibly be. I mean, eight years ago. And for, and for me, I mean, as young women, you know, in our thirties, like basically we would never think of mortality, let alone maternal mortality could happen to like, uh, you know, us like as, so right there is, um, is, is just, dark you know it's a dark place yeah and And it's um, about the the whole situation anytime you know you bring it up you know or you have to talk about it I mean it it just the emotional aspect of it is just different than anything else you'll ever experience it's always an open wound that's what I wanted to say it's it's the wound can always be freshly open the moment that we go there agreed yes it's kind of like you band-aid and, and it's fine. And then, you know, it's easily and uh, removed and, you know, the emotions come back and they're pretty raw. Yeah. It's a living nightmare. And, um, we can, we, it, it is, it's, it's one of these coping, you have to be a really strong person, I think in life anyway, just to cope with like all the other things like COVID and like, you know, bills and your home and, and, you know, being a good role model and all of these things, but to add, on this extra heavy heavy it's not like you know I always say like catch up on a white couch this is a way different and you know we forget that we're just like little specks on in this you know in this universe you right. know and um and the and and the big picture here is um is is traumatic, which is why, you know, some women might say, oh, she's so dramatic or she's so traumatic, or, you know, they might say something that is insensitive, but that's only because, you know, they haven't experienced it yet. Agreed. And it's, and and, you know, and I say that, but, and I, I, that's exactly how I feel. But then to think, I don't ever want anybody to experience it. You know what I mean? If they have to tag me as dramatic with certain things or over the top, I don't ever want anybody to experience that. I, I, it was just, and I know for you, you know, certainly hearing your story too, nobody wants to relive any of our journeys. It is just not something you want to ever go back to, or how, I mean, and I honestly feel like a lot of us are traumatized to the point that we relive it every day, you know? It was, it's almost like sometimes, and I don't know if this is about for you, but like 
they say, oh, I don't want PPCM to define me. Well, here we are. <laughs> here we are. I mean, I can't run from it. Right. I can't, I can't not speak up. Like you say, That's right. this is preventable and we live, it's our obligation as women that lived to speak yeah. up. I agree. And, and that is, um, you know, a big part of this platform of the docu-series yeah. that will be endless um, because it's almost as if like documentation is proof of, of not just self-advocacy, like I said, but it's documentation that this is something that, you know, n not just should, but at this point come around, you know, 2020, 2022, this should, there, there should be some resolution to this pregnancy movement. And, Great. you know, and, you know, I take on like this leadership to basically say that enough women have suffered and enough women have had their times of death, left their loved ones behind, and knowing that it can be prevented by a simple blood test, it would be it, it would be almost as if like I at this point it does define me, you know. It has to for you to, to be willing to do what you're doing. I mean, yeah. you know, you have to accept it as, as who you are and, you know, kind of pull through for everybody else, like you said, that didn't. And, you know, I kind of feel like, you know, that's. Yeah, like you you said, speaking today, coming forward, just like having this conversation is basically you walk through fire, you're holding buckets and you're hoping that you can put out a fire for a person that's watching this, that is struggling with being undiagnosed, not treated, knowing something's wrong, but the doctors are saying that they're fine. You know, um, what advice could you give to a woman today that is watching this in this experience and experiencing what we have experienced um, during the time of pregnancy? I would definitely say, you know, speak up. Don't just mention things, but really speak your concerns. Um, you know, be specific with them. Don't be vague. Don't say my feet are swollen. My feet are swollen to what extent? You know, um, you know, I, I feel my heart racing to what extent? You know, I remember every time I would go for a checkup and I'm in the medical field, still trying not to be over dramatic at the time. I only got my blood pressure checked laying down. That is a huge sign because when you're laying down, that is when your blood pressure is at its lowest. So that triggered something for me later. Why would you not check it sitting up? Because you knew it was going to be high. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So just understanding and educating, um, just in general, me saying, Make sure just something as little as making sure your blood pressure's checked sitting up. You know, that would just seem so normal. They would only check mine laying down. It was still elevated laying down. So you imagine me walking from my car to my office, which was several breathless. hundred breathless, a heart mm -hmm. rate of 130 over nine months period, swelling mm -hmm. with not even being able to tie my shoes because my shoe, my feet wouldn't fit in them. Same. You know, just be aware, you know, if you see things, I, I feel like in my heart of hearts, I knew something wasn't right, but I also felt like I wanted to, to trust who yes. I went to. And I think sometimes just realizing that they're human, we're bringing awareness, advocate for yourself. If you do not feel right, you have any any inside feeling and your gut is telling you something wrong, search, look, you know, whatever it is, mention it and be specific. Ask for numbers, ask for your blood pressure, you know, ask for normalcy, make them tell you specifically why they think that your pregnancy is normal. Because after looking at my, my chart, even last night, the doctor that followed me, every time I went in, my chart said normal pregnancy excluding, and there was a code. 
when I looked up the code, it said edema. Okay, that doesn't tell you to the severity. When I looked at everything charted from when Dr. Lee finally got his hands on me the day that I gave birth, everything said severe, severe preeclampsia, severe edema, severe loss of breath, severe tachycardia. That's the difference in these doctors and a difference in really the Lord placing that doctor there because who knows what would have happened. You know, the documentation alone was, and I just happened to look at it last night, logged on to my portal and went that far back. And that was eye opening from normal pregnancy with edema to severe everything that didn't happen overnight. That was progressive. And I know that. Um, so, you know, that's a lot of advice, but I would say be specific. No, it's actually, it's, it, it, it is, it's very, it's, it's very good advice because it's like, doctors are just people. It's, we're, we're the one that, we're the ones that are educating them. Yes. We, we want them to know because we put our lives in their hands while we have a life growing inside of us. Agreed. But, um, it is very um, frustrating that a person that delivers babies for years and years and years, um, you know, doesn't doesn't pick up these, you know, doesn't pick up the 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 right blood test or the right signs to say okay, you know, early enough before your life where the results are severe. Right. And, um, you know, I, I can't even go back to my medical records because they didn't give them to me. They, they're not real. We went back to the high risk management and noticed that one of the people at the high risk management at Cedar sinai um, had a completely different um, medical records. And, you know, John, my husband's standing behind him. He's like, wait, we don't have those. And he immediately shut the computer down, you know? Um, so I don't even have results to go back to. Um, I can go back to as far as the hospital that saved me in Arizona, because that's where I coded, thank goodness of the grace of God, because uh, it was Thanksgiving. And if I was in California and where I was at, I, I, I would not be here today. Um, they sent right. me home and said that I had a urinary tract infection seven days later, I had a cardiac arrest with them inducing it. So obviously, you know, them saying that I was not ill um, was not true. Um, right. You know, any lawyer can say that it doesn't matter if you died. It doesn't matter if you had your time of death called. It's whatever they say. And I think that's crap. Right. That's unacceptable. And so this is where our fight is for, Agreed. you know, women to say the the legislation, the laws, the bills that need to pass for the, these preventions um, as early as 10 weeks, the standards of screening labs and testings for all women should be yeah. updated. Um, and, you know, these conversations should not be said like as we are right now for the first time, you know, when this should be an ancient conversation, as I always say. And yeah, you know, I mean, it's that's very good advice because we do rely on our doctors. I mean, I had the best and so many at, at the best hospital. Yeah. At the best, ho at the best hospital, at the best doctors and it wasn't just the the east tower it was the west tower and it was not just the towers it was the the clinics it was the er it was it was everyone no one had awareness which is why probably that woman died in on at the same hospital november 21st around the same time that i coded this time 2021 whereas mine happened in 20, 2016 where there mm -hmm. should have been some prior education and training of the awareness of, of the disease at that hospital. They should have learned from my experience. Instead, mm -hmm. they, they wanted me as far away from the hospital. They wanted, they did not have any interest in being educated. They, um, they, they were very 
unprofessional and disrespectful to not just me, but to the entire disease oh. of peripartum cardiomyopathy, as well as the lack of respect for women who suffer and die from maternal mortality. Yeah, and, um, yeah. And I'm, like you said, you wish you spoke up more. You, you should have known. Well, when you're sick and you're not well, it's almost like you need somebody to think and do for you. I'm a very I'm a smart think woman. A lot of it was they are educated in this. You know, I try not to overstep my boundaries. This is your that field. Too. No, but exactly. Know your boundaries. I feel like a lot of just just us in the world, your primary you you're primarily learning from experience. And we have to realize that even though they're our doctors, they're supposed to be there for us, they're guiding us through this pregnancy, they learned textbook just like the rest of us. You know, if you're their first experience, you know, that's a sad call. But be with an OBGYN that is open-minded and understands your concerns. You know, I don't know if, to be honest with you, if I was Dr. Lee's first case, we have honestly not. I know he's had, had one no, after. I would ever know. But he, even today, he just says, you know, hey, you see my gray hair? You know, that's from you. But he, he fought for me as hard as I fought for myself. And that's the one thing I'm thankful for is laying eyes on a girl that walks in your office and says, my heart rate's been 130 since 3 a.m. He never second guessed me. He looked at me, assessed me. He put forth a lot of effort. I remember waking up and he would be over my bed ordering things. I mean, that says a lot about a doctor. And for me, that's where I put um, a lot of thankfulness in. But at the same time, I realized that we have to speak up for ourselves because we don't know their experiences. We know that they're educated, but experience in this is where it lies to know how to save that woman that is fighting for her life and her child's suffocating I, to death. You know, we With all we, just all that needs to be removed is the fluid and the infection being cured. I mean, really, it's like you would think that the common sense behind the medicine would have clicked. Um, it's not like women have just started giving, you know, birth. Um, right. This should have been definitely a study a long time ago. Very long. Um, you know, so um, it's it's really it's and that's. Listen, you know, hey, you know, bloom early, bloom late, as long as you bloom. Um, and so we are we are definitely watering the seed. And hopefully we can definitely watch this grow to a real change for all women and for our children's children. And we look forward. You know, yeah, and, and watching you know, this docu-series um, unfold because yes, documentation is, is, is key during pregnancy, after pregnancy, you know, pictures. I mean, I'm sure like you, less words for me, I can show you, I show you a photo <laughs> the day I got pregnant, the day I coded and when I woke up, you know, um, back to, back to somewhat me looking normal. I mean, the progression is just, the visual is like, you don't need any words. No. Yeah. It, <laughs> looking back, it, like, how did somebody not know something was wrong? Yeah. I mean, you could pop. I could pop. My face <laughs> was huge. I could literally, you could, just, yeah. I couldn't even walk. I was sometimes literally rolling because my feet were so swollen and my body because it was everywhere the fluid was just everywhere and Agreed. I was like 
you know, Poppy from Let's Get Back Up Again at the end, you know, when she ate that blueberry and she blew up and then she's like, ah, you know, at the end, that was my fight song. Yeah. The, my heart surgery, the, the, the everything, like I must have played it just in that morning, headed to the surgery room, you know, before they gave you that cocktail. Yeah. I was like playing that song over and over and over again because um you know it was definitely um you know we I always ask somebody like what's your fight song you know like when you're losing your your face and like you have to go under the knife again you know it's different when you you give birth like that's planned mm -hmm. you know I didn't plan on you going into my heart do you know that's what I'm right. saying yeah so, yeah it, and of with a three-month-year-old baby <laughs> Or an 18-month-year-old baby. I mean, it's just awful. Um, but do you have a fight song? I don't, actually. I've, I've honestly not really not really thought about it. Um, probably after this one, I'm going to have one. I'm going to have to find one. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm, I, I just gravitated to Poppy, I think, at the time because – what was that? It was 2016. It just came out, I think, oh. and – you know, if you watch the video to the to to it and everything and, you know, the words and it's just I just was relating to it. And, you know, I always try to add a little humor with, um, you know, when like literally like when like shit hits the fan, like you have to like definitely throw some curveball of humor or you can yes. go crazy. So. Well definitely an outlet if you can't find that in in this diagnosis it will definitely drown you absolutely so, yeah I find I find that you know I'll never forget when when my mom was alive and she was always like my biggest like you know because she always knew I was she she knew there was something wrong and she was the one that was like you know she just knew it and I had her on three-way with me and um we had the hardest laugh. I was like literally on the kitchen floor. I remember because I had the defibrillator in my veins were blue, black. They were webbed all the way down my arm. It was really, really bad. And, wow. um, and I needed to get my defibrillator out. And this was on February 12th, 2019. And I'm writing emails, 911. I'm dying because I really was dying, but I knew I was dying. And, um, I even had, I have photos of it and everything. And I'm on the phone three way. And when I, when she answered the phone, she had like one of those nasal voice and she's like, wow. And I'm like, hi, I'm like, I, I, I need to arrange a defibrillator removal. I'm, I'm going to probably die within the next 24 hours. And, um, I have these symptoms Hold, please. And it was like, so funny the way she did it. Cause it was like, almost <laughs> as if like, you know, it was a joke and the music that they played was horrible and it was like really bad music. So we just started to laugh because I'm like, I have less than probably hours to live. You put me on hold. It was just really funny. And the hold was a very long time, but it was like the music and her and, and, and my mom, I, we both knew it was just one of the funniest moments because, you know, you're dying and it's like somebody like you know, puts you like, doesn't put you, patch you through to your doctor. And, it, it, and it's like funny in a sense, because you're, you're dying, but the, but the way it happened and the humor behind it with the nasally receptionist, with the awful music. And it's like, you could die at any moment, but they still want you to hold. It's like, okay, like I'm dying. Hold please. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yep. it was at the time we were laughing so hard. I mean, we both were crying. It was so funny. Um, but, you know, Horrible looking experience. back, it's like not funny, but not funny. Yeah. Well, I mean, you have to find humor in things and, you know, you, you got to find it where you can, I guess, especially at that point. Yeah. I mean, like that was probably one of my my most humorous moments was is that when I was dying and I was told to be put on hold. Um, and it was, I, I think what the funny part was is that it was, it, I, she never came back. 
I had to recall again because the hold was over 40 something minutes long. And um, yeah, so it, it was just the the whole scenario was just like really funny. I mean, ha, did you ever at your like most darkest moments just start like busting out laughing like for something that was just because you had to turn it into something funny? Well, I mean, I I don't remember. I can't really tell you a certain time, but I just knew that probably the first month I you know, you, you have a lot of information and you're trying to learn. And I remember after that, I was like, there's no going back. We're going to turn this into anything that it can be that mentally I can overcome. So yeah, I mean, at some point you just kind of have to, you know, you're giggling at anything you can at that point, because first of all, that's great medicine, but you know, anything from, I remember trying to do, um, again, one of my first exercises, but I, prior to the one that I was telling you about, I told my husband, I'm about to get down on the floor. I'm, I'm going to do, I mean, I could do sit-ups and crunches without any problem. Right. I think I might've got to 10 and thought I was going to literally die and lose my breath. And I remember just starting laughing because I was like, <laughs> who is the person that I have right. become? Now I've got to learn to love her. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, you know, we giggled and he kind of giggled and said, I don't think we're supposed to be doing this right now. But, you know, you're 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 really grasping at straws. You're trying to do anything you can yeah. to regain some Laugh power. at yourself because you can't do the sit ups when you could have rocked it like all day. Um, yeah. yeah, it's it's <laughs> almost like I could I could totally sit, see you just like like lying back and just kind of having a laugh. And, you know, that's just you being really kind to yourself, you know, and being your own best friend, because it's like at that point, I mean, it's not funny, but you, you got to laugh because it is. It's yeah. like, who is this person? You know, yeah. um, for sure. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. it's and it's. It is. It's, it's almost like when we say that we're relearning ourselves, it's, it's physical, it's mental, it's, it's our daily life. It's, it's, it's what we have to implement. It's, it's everything. Um, and as well as being a new mommy. Um, yeah. so yeah, I mean, I, your, your baby's now is obviously she's nine, correct? Well, she'll be eight in April. She'll be eight in April. And, um, does she know that she's a PPCM baby? Does she know what that uh, means? She does. Yes. And we've actually, um, there was a girl um, on the page that had a heart transplant mm -hmm. and did a lot of lives. And she actually watched her with me. And um, yeah, I mean, she's, you know, at seven, that's a lot to grasp, but she understands more than I thought she would. And, um, very attentive. Like if I have not feeling well, you know, you still have kind of some rough days, especially with some of the latter diagnoses, um, super attentive. Like I never want her to feel like, um, she was the reason or the cause. And so I really veer from that aspect of it, but her understanding a lot of things, um, and even watching other women go through it, um, yeah, I just want her to be aware, you know, and I certainly pray every night that she does not have this. I don't know genetically where this can go. I'm not educated on that at all. But, um, but yeah, she watches. Well, that's why we are, all our PPCM babies are studies. And I have on the refrigerator, um, his EKG and his BNP test coming up. Um, because, at five, there's they say around five or like eight, it's mm -hmm. good to know where they're at. Like you said, um, the BNP test is just as important for them. Yeah, know? well, um, to go to a cardiologist, um, mm -hmm. and well, she would get it from her pediatrician. Gotcha. Okay, we, yeah. you know, things that I've brought up with them, and I don't know. I think it still goes back to awareness because. You know, I'm still so, I can tell sometimes I always wonder what stress was placed on her Sure. in general. Um, so there's a lot I still have to be educated on in, in the big picture. And you also have to, you know, think about, you know, girls are different than boys where 
while you are carrying her in your belly, she's also carrying your grandchildren. So really, you're carrying both. You're right. carrying you're carrying two generations mm -hmm. inside of you as a woman. For a boy, they don't have a uterus. They don't have that, you know, so <laughs> it's it's different. And I wonder what the difference between a PPCM girl baby as opposed to a PPCM boy baby. And hey. and you know, these are this is what our job is to can you know, follow up, we can do a continued interview solely on our PPCM babies and, um, you know, and compare BNPs, compare EKGs from, you know, you know, different stages of their right. age and, and, and have them, I know it's, it's horrible to poke a little, a boo-boo, you know, but, you know, we give them vaccinations, we give, you know, we do what we got to do, but, right. um, this is blood. This is not injecting anything. This is not made in a lab. This is not, this is basically taking your blood and knowing the functionality and, you know, the fact that the blood test of the BNP can determine early cancer, early other fluid diseases. Um, so is, ask them is to test that BNP on her? Absolutely. Okay. Got you. Mm -hmm. and make sure that number is up to 99 I believe it's just so much I'm very eager to watch and learn I lost you I, I believe that the fluid disease uh -huh. is um can branch out into many diseases okay. for us the fluid disease caused our hearts to fail we didn't have heart problems before this we didn't have our heart was affected by the fluid. When cancer is produced, it's because it's produced by a trigger, by a trauma, by, right. uh, uh, you know, which is why it's common for PPCM women to get cancer. Right. You know, it's like, oh, where's your cancer? You know, I got it scraped out. Thank God I knew my BNP because then I would have not known that I would have had cancer. And it right. seems like, that would be so easy to solve for even child cancer if we right. had our children, you know, their blood tested the day that we go and give them whatever vaccinations that they need that are mandatory, that there would be more awareness of, okay, well, my child has the beginning of, of cancer, you know, and I just saved my child from getting the BNP test of knowing if those levels are, are elevated right? and, and cure it with early diagnosis. So it doesn't turn into a disease. So it right. doesn't turn into heart disease. So that fluid doesn't turn into dementia or cancer or something that's whether it's preventable or not like preeclampsia and dementia not preventable but i don't know if that's possible we don't yeah. have enough information because we haven't caught it early enough with the end with the bnp test if right. it's mandatory you know maybe that would change maybe they would right. say okay maybe you can't prevent it but you can lessen the symptoms with the proper treatment that we would use for women with heart failure. Right. And so unless there is that awareness, especially with a child, I think even more so that the fact that we have this knowledge mm -hmm. to, to apply it on our child and grade it in their brains that every year they must have a BNP test. They must have a test and they must know their number and say, okay, is your number below 99? You know, like, right. what was your number? What, what was your results? What was your BNP test number? You asking me? Yeah. Back I in don't, I never got that. Okay. And so, so you don't know what it is today either. And I guess, let me say this. I say I never got it. There was so much information that I don't know that I, I would know have if even, you did. 
yeah, I don't even know. That. And I even last night when I was looking, I was not actually looking for that. But I noticed when I look and read on a lot of um, things on on the page, um, that's something that keeps triggering me. Like, why do I not know that? And I'm, I shouldn't say I never, I was never told. It, it's not registering to me. It did not, I was not educated in that direction. Um, but it's definitely something that I have said is going to be um, a new question. And I want to find out more of that because so many of you guys understand that and to which I do not. Well, I think that it's all about us educating ourselves. Like, right. for example, like, I think that we should continue this on a different interview and like catch up and make it about really getting down to um our our ppcm babies you're you have a ppcm baby girl i have a ppcm baby boy mine is five yours is eight you know let's let's talk about you know their ekg their bnp levels and see if you know just kind of something might be discovered you know they are they are studies i think one thing that we should include maybe in their next interview is what was the test since you're so close with your cardiologist mm -hmm. um, and you were diagnosed, even if it was at some point I was never diagnosed. So um, until I, until death, so I don't have anything to compare it to, but if you were to ask your doctor and say, Hey, what was the test that diagnosed me for you to say that I am a peripartum cardiomyopathy PPCM survivor, what was that test? Was it the BNP or was it a different test? Okay. You know, ask yeah. him. And then I would really like to know because I'm always curious because I don't have that to go back to. I didn't right. have that. Okay. So I'm always curious and I do like to ask okay, if you were diagnosed, what was the test that they asked? What was the test that gave you that diagnosis? Right. What did they use? What was the blood test? Maybe there's something different than what we know. Right. You know, and and that's why these conversations should be continued because we're putting the pieces together, you know. And well, we can- I'm certainly thankful that you did all of this and came up with all of this because- you know, again, even almost eight years in, I'm constantly learning. So definitely thankful for what you've done and your story. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, we definitely, you know, if it doesn't kill us, it makes us stronger. <laughs> we're sure. we're and, um, you know, I, I come from, because I was so healthy, I come from a place of justice. Agreed. And it's it's not just for me, it's yeah. it's for so many. It's for women who have 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 suffered and lived, women that are not aware, women that are dead, families that are, you know, suffering from the loss. I mean, it, it's there's just so many reasons that um, documentation and a docu series is what's going to possibly create real change for this movement, and I. I believe that, you know, uh, and I, I believe that, you know, also, you know, you know, dreams can come true. And, you know, I, you know, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. That was just, you know, on Monday, you know, he uh, had a dream and his, his voice was his power. He was a hero. And right. to today, you know, as a leader, you know, my son was last night, you know, watching and learning about him. And um, that's kind of like how I am like interpreting that all our voices, not just my voice, but your voice and another voice, our dream as women is to prevent which is something that's already preventable, but preventing with awareness that right. this can be prevented and, Absolutely. and that hope that America 
gets FDA approved to the diagnosis that other countries have out there, which is why they have a less death rate, why our death rate is so high. You know, I think our dream is to, you know, to be heard that this there needs to be change, you know, Agreed. and and for women to have a, a death sentence when there's a possible, you know, prevention is um, is sad. It's yeah. it's very sad. So thank you. No, I I, I you know I appreciate that. And I, I do take on the challenge and, um, thankful that you did, because this is definitely, um, it's encouraging and I'm excited about it. I think it's pretty oh, cool. Good. Yes. Tell everybody to watch okay. and, um, you know, and, and hopefully we, you know, we're as honest and transparent and real as, you know, as just like any woman with, you know, a sister or a cousin or an aunt or a niece or anyone, or if you're a grandmother and you're watching this and you have grandchildren, I mean, this is the time, you know, for women to, you know, start speaking up, uh, taking on leadership, each individual, um, and, and creating, you know, a, a voice on this, on this cause that can hopefully, um, you know, 2020, 2023, hopefully yeah. FDA with these docu <laughs> docu series is enough proof that um, it's it's time to approve this the new standards screenings yeah. and testings. I'm certainly ready. So this is exciting. Thank you so much and for your time and. I look forward, you know, connecting with you again and following yes. up on those numbers and um, the test of diagnosis because I think that would be oh. really, that would be cool. That would be awesome. Well, thanks for all you've done. Thank you. And same to you. Thank you for showing up and, um, you Anytime. know, and telling me your painful truth. Well, I appreciate you and definitely inspiring to hear your story. Absolutely. All right. God have a good night. And have a wonderful night. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Thank you for joining us and listening to the PPCM Fund podcast. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe. PPCM's Painful Truth is made possible through the generous support of donors like you. Help us spread the awareness by donating at ppcmfund.com or click the link below to become a member through Ko-fi. Also, remember to join us every Monday and Friday for Mom Day Fitness. Have a great day.